Good morning. I want to begin today for a lot of you what's going to be a little bit of a, a way back machine moment. And I want to ask you a question. What were you afraid of as a kid? You can think back to that time when you had those childhood fears. What were you afraid of? Uh, I, I made a list this week, did some research, and so I brought some images that may kind of bring some things to mind. Some of you were, were scared of loud noises, and so when it would get really stormy or windy or the, the rain or the hail, that would freak you out. Uh, others of you, you had to always have that nightlight because you were afraid of the dark, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't do that. Uh, maybe it was going to the doctor. Some of you are still afraid of going to the doctor, even though you're not a kid anymore. Uh, I get that. Uh, and then some of you were afraid of strangers. You were afraid of weird people being around around you. Uh, I brought a picture of Scott when he was a little boy uh, right here. I was a towhead. And, uh, and I had some fears. Uh, one of my friends, uh, his mom made dolls. And so I would go visit his house and I'd always have to sleep in the doll room. <laughs> and, and my mom at a certain point, said, she said, Scott, why do you always want him to come sleep over at our house? I said, mom, the dolls. I just, I'm freaked out by the dolls, you know? Uh, at one point, my brother and I, we were home by ourselves, and, and I have a memory of just hearing a sound of somebody jiggling our front door, you know, handle to make sure it was actually locked. And so, as a kid, I was afraid of our house getting broken into. I was afraid of burglars. I was afraid at night, hey, somebody's going to break in. But, but one of the biggest fears I had when I was a kid was of eternity, just eternity freaked me out. Like the idea of unending existence was just way more than my, my little brain could handle. And so I was afraid of dying because I was afraid of living forever. Yeah, I, I think like dying and be done totally, that, that wasn't scary for me, but, but living forever was just way too much. And, and I thought at that point that I was the only one who wasn't looking forward to life after death. But I've been a pastor and I've been in church long enough to discover that there are some surprising perceptions that are present in us in this room today in the church about heaven. And so I wanted to share with you three that I've discovered. And the first one is this. On many occasions, I've heard people say, I don't want to go to heaven. I'm actually not looking forward to it. <laughs> and maybe you're like, man, I wasn't the only one. Now, 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 some people would say, hey, I don't want to go to heaven, and they're not saying, hey, I'd rather go to the other place, you know, the bad place. But I think one of the scandals in the church today is how many people are not actually looking to and looking forward to life after death. Paul famously said in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I wonder for you, that, that statement, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, could you say that and mean that? That for you to die would be gain? I've got a friend, and last year we had a, we had a really meaningful conversation because he said, Scott, I, I, I kind of rediscovered that verse and I realized even though I'm a follower of Jesus, I can't actually say that verse and mean it. Because to me, to die is not gain. He's like, there are so many things that are part of my life today that I'm not ready to let go of. There's so many things on my list of the things I want to accomplish and things that I want to see my kids do and I want to see my family do. And, and if I was to die today, I would not see it as gain. I would see it as loss. And, and maybe you can relate to that. The, the other perception I, I wanted to share today is some people say, um, I don't want to live, just get me to heaven now. And, and maybe, maybe that's more common for you. You know, I, I, you're just like, Scott, if there was an eject button that I could push to get me out of here, I would be, I'd be breaking that button. And, and, and for some of you, maybe that's because you're at a place where you've battled so many health issues. You're just like, I'm so ready for a new body. Maybe for others of you, you've gotten to the season in life where there's maybe more life behind you than there is in front of you, and you're just longing for heaven. Or maybe it's because just the world and the state that things are in, you're just like, I would rather get out of here. But then maybe there's a third perception, and you're like, Scott, I, I'm, I'm not really looking forward to this series because I don't get those people who are obsessed with heaven. 
You probably know somebody in your life who just, man, they are just obsessed. They're kind of like this guy, but with heaven. Like they know all the, they've got charts and they've got color coded. They got everything. And, and, and those people, maybe you're like, I don't get them. Maybe you can resonate with the words of Oliver Wendell Holmes from 150 years ago when he said, some people are so heavenly minded that they are of no earthly good. And maybe that's you. You're like, Scott, I, I don't know where you're going with this, but I don't want to get so caught up in heaven that I no longer have something to offer here. And so here's what we're going to do. Over the next seven Sundays, including today, we're going to wade into this question of what happens after you die. And we're going to talk about heaven. We're going to talk about hell. We're going to talk about life after death. We're going to talk about uh, something that most of you probably haven't heard of, life after, life after death. We'll get to that in a couple weeks. But we're going to talk about what the Scripture says and what it doesn't say, what, what we believe that's actually rooted in Scripture and what we believe that has its you know, place outside of Scripture, you know, that maybe we shouldn't believe. Uh, we're, we're going to wade into a lot of things. But, but the big idea of the whole series and the big idea of today is this, and this will kind of give you an idea of where we're going with this series. If you're taking notes, you can fill in the blanks on this one. The big idea for this series is this, how is what I believe about what happens after I die shaping how I live today? How is what I believe about what happens after I die, how is that shaping how I live today? today. Let me just play my cards for a little bit this morning. I'm not trying to help you win the game of trivial pursuit, life after death edition. I don't want to just give you, you know, trivia and knowledge and information. I don't want to help you become so heavenly minded that you are of no earthly good. Really, my agenda with this series is to expose you in Scripture to what Scripture says about what happens after you die so that the way you live now with however much God gives you, and I don't know how much that's going to be. You don't have a little expiration date in your forehead, and neither do I. We don't know how long God's going to give us. But my hope is you would realize that there is a direct connection between eternity and today. And that connection is connected through your beliefs. That what you believe about eternity, it shapes how you live today for better or for worse. And so I want to talk about what do we believe and what does Scripture teach so that we can live today in such a way that makes the most of it. So this morning, as we kind of begin this series, there's three principles that I want you to ponder. Hopefully, I'm going to give you some stuff that you can think about when you're driving or standing in the shower or talking with your friends or out for a walk, because hopefully spring is coming this week. <laughs> Snow in April should just be against the law. But here's the first principle. Our biggest danger today is not that we are too heavenly minded, but that we are too easily influenced by the world. I don't think we are in the danger of what Oliver Wendell Holmes said, that we're so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly good. I think the danger is actually the opposite. I think the danger is that we're, we're so earthly minded and we're so easily influenced by the world. And if you were here in February and March, we did a series called Live No Lies. We talked about the influences of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we said that for the sake of that term, we're talking about the world in a negative way. The world is a system of ideas and practices shaped by rebellion against God and a redefinition of good and evil. And, and I think our greatest danger is that we are too easily influenced by the world, by this. And we're warned about this in Scripture. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'd encourage you to open up to 1 John chapter 2. If you were here for our series, Live No Lies, this passage is going to be familiar, but I wanted to revisit it. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Here's what it says. John, one of the closest disciples of Jesus, he says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world with its lust is passing away, 
but the one who does the will of God remains forever. I, I, I want you to look at a picture here on the screen. It's actually two pictures, side by side. And if, if you can, I want you to try to find the differences between those two pictures. Just look really closely. They're the same picture. <laughs> Some of you are like, Scott, I can't find it. I'm trying to find it. They're the same picture. And, and the reason why I put that up there is that, that when you're predisposed that something is different, you get really fixated on finding the differences. But if two things are the same, no matter how hard you look, you will not find any differences. And I think this is a great symbol of the great danger that we are in. That many of us, there are no discernible differences to how we live than how someone who does not share our beliefs about eternity and this world live. That there, for many of us, there's no difference in, in how we view situations than people who don't share our faith. There's no way that, that when we talk about people who are our enemies is different than people who don't share our faith. When it comes to our morality, when it comes to our ethics, when it comes to our language, when it comes to our choices, when it comes to our spending, for many of us, there, there is no discernible difference between the way we live and the way our world lives. And yet as followers of Jesus, we are called to live differently and not live like the world, but we're also not called to live separately. There's, there's a word that's a big word in the Bible, and it's the word holiness. And, and the word holiness means set apart, pure. And all too often in the church, we take this teaching of holiness, and what we do is we don't actually live different, we just live separate. We don't actually have qualitative difference in the way that we treat people or the way that we talk, the way we spend our money, our thought life. We just are disengaged from the world. And that's not holiness. That's just separatism. And Jesus, in fact, prays against that exact thing in his final prayer in John 17. He says to his father, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. He says, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And so if you're like, Scott, I just want to get out of this world as fast as I can. I'm pressing that eject button. Friends, what you may be doing in pressing the eject button prematurely is pressing the disobedience button. Because Jesus' final prayer was that God would not eject you out of the world, but send you into it. And you're like, but that's hard. I know. But so is being sent into the world to die on the cross. And Jesus says, Father, as you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And I would just tell you that trying to evacuate yourself from a hard moment in time or a hard place of calling or a hard relationship because people around you are sinful, what you may be doing is asking God to abandon the calling that Jesus introduced 2,000 years ago. And that's why I would just encourage you, if, if you're as, like, your, your view is, Scott, I love this heaven stuff, get me out of here as fast as I can. I get the longing, and yes, we long for heaven and we long for Jesus to come, but if he does not say yes immediately, we've been sent. And what if our bigger problem is that we are so worldly-minded that we are of no good to this world or to heaven? What if our problem is not that we're so heavenly minded that we're of no earthly good? What if our problem is we're, we're so worldly minded that we're no good to God and his mission and purpose for us in this world? What if? That's the first thing I want you to chew on this week.
The second one is this. When our view of heaven leads to escapism, we're doing it wrong. When our view of heaven leads to escapism, we're doing it wrong. Now, you say, Scott, what is the word escapism? Well, well, often what happens in this life, in this moment, is that we will pull out our phones, and through our phones, we are able to be places digitally that we are not physically. So you've probably had a moment, maybe you had it this week when it was snowing in April, where you were longing for the beach. You were longing for warm weather. And because of the beauty of technology now, there are people, there are influencers who literally spend their whole year traveling around the world, being paid by brands and hotels and companies to take pictures and videos of places where they are. And so while it's snowing where you are, on your device, you can be in Tahiti. And you're, you're having kind of an escapism moment, like, you're like, get me out of the snow and the cold, get me onto a beach. And what's interesting is that in June... When it's warm and muggy before the monsoon rolls in, you will have an escapism of the opposite way. Some will be posting photos from Aspen. And you'll be like, get me there because I'm tired of being hot and sweaty. And it's this kind of escapism that often infects our approach to heaven. And it's this escapism that Holmes was talking about when he said some people are so heavenly minded that they are of no earthly good. That, that, that there, there was this potential mindset that we get so fixated and caught up in what the Scripture says about heaven that it stops connecting with the life we're he- having here on earth. And yet I love what C.S. Lewis says in his book, Mere Christianity. He says, a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking. But it is one of the things a Christian is actually meant to do. He says, it not, does not mean that we're to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have been so ineffective in this world. Aim at heaven and you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. So yes, for some of you, your danger is you're, you're hitting the disobedience button because you're trying to leave what God's called you to. For others of us, we actually need to spend more time thinking about heaven. We need more time reflecting on life after death. We need more knowledge of what it's going to be so that we don't just settle for this world as if this is all there is. I cut out a section of the quote because Lewis got a little wordy there and it was going to be a lot of slides. But he lists off a number of people who were followers of Jesus, who were heavenly minded, and their vision of heaven influenced their life on earth. Like William Wilberforce, who gave his life to end the slave trade in the British Empire. Like Frederick Douglass, who fought against the slave problem in the United States. In his book, Dominion, uh, the historian, I just went blank on his name, was a British historian, came to become open to faith because he realized the influence that followers of Jesus had on the world. Their vision of heaven shaped their life on earth. And that is in fact the reason why you have the book of Revelation in your Bible. Did you know that? It wasn't just so that weird people could create charts on TV shows. (laughs) The book of Revelation was not written, written to us in 21st century America. The book of Revelation was written to seven churches in Asia Minor in the first century. And their problem was not TikTok or cable news or fake news. Their problem was they were followers of Jesus in a Roman Empire that had turned against them. Under the reigns of emperors Diocletian and Nero, Christians became the scapegoats for all that was wrong with the empire, and they began to be persecuted relentlessly. 
And those churches were sent the vision, the written down revelation that John had received so that they could know what was to come. And so if you read Revelation, you you get a vision of the end, of what happens for us after we die, but what happens for the world at the end. And, And it wasn't just so that they would long for it or know about it. Revelation was intended to help the early church engage this world, not escape it. And so when you read Revelation and and you stop engaging the world around you and you just seek to escape it, you're reading it differently than the early church would have. And that's why the church, when they receive those notes, it's kind of like the pre-notes at the beginning of Revelation in chapters 2 and 3 and those seven churches get letters. Six of them get really harsh treatments. We preached through this section of Revelation before the pandemic. And what you find there is six of the seven churches were not actually being faithful. They were compromising. What were they compromising to? The world. And so what what does John do? He says, hey, I'm going to give you a vision of what's to come. I'm going to help you be more heavenly minded so that you no longer compromise in the world, but in fact, you engage the world differently as followers of Jesus. Eight days ago, we we gathered here in this room and we celebrated Easter. And the travesty is that for many followers of Jesus who are in what I would call low church churches like ours, where there's not big long liturgies and you're not doing squats all morning, standing up and sitting down and standing up and sitting down. Some churches, it's like a workout, you know, your your quads are sore after church. You're just up and down so much. In those settings, what happens is that Easter isn't a day, it's a season. If you've got friends who are Episcopal or um, Anglican or Presbyterian, Easter is a season. It begins on Easter Sunday and it runs until Pentecost. Most non-denominational or kind of uh, more, more, you know, non-denominational or kind of um, evangelical phrase like us, Easter is a day and then it's done. But here's the thing. Resurrection is not a day. It's the linchpin of our faith. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, you pull it out, the whole thing falls apart. It's like Jenga. It's that last piece. And here's what N.T. Wright says about the resurrection. He says, people who believe in the resurrection, in God making a whole new world in which everything will be set right at last, they are unstoppably motivated to work for that new world in the present. So if we really believe that the tomb is empty, that Jesus conquered death, Amen. thank you, we do believe it, then it shouldn't just affect us for one day in the spring. It should become the lens through which we see the world and we begin to work and ask God, bring, what did he ask us to pray? Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Again, he is constantly connecting eternity and today. And that's why I'm asking you. And and again, I can't answer this question for you. The big idea on Thursday was a sentence. We turned it into a question after our staff discussed it. Because we want you to wrestle with this. How is what you believe about what happens after you die shaping how you live today? I don't know that. Only you can know that. And I want you to answer that question and you wrestle with that question. Here's the third thing for today. There is a lot more to know about what happens after we die than we realize. Scripture actually says more than I think a lot of us think it says. And that's why I can make this series seven weeks. If there wasn't a whole lot, it'd be a two-week series. But there's a lot But some of us have been taught or have kind of been exposed to, hey, there's not much we can know. And for some of us, that's based upon how we've been told the scriptures speak. So for example, in 1 Corinthians 2, Paul writes, but as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and no human heart has conceived, God has prepared for those who love him. So I once heard somebody preach 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to mean, hey, you really can't know. You can't know because no eye can see, no heart can understand. We can't conceive what God's prepared for us. And and so it was kind of the takeaway from the message was, you know, basically, don't worry, be happy. God's got it. You know, and there's a song for that. So you can sing that to yourself. 
But, but then this spring, as I was getting ready for this series, I, I pulled back out a book that's been on my shelf for a long time, and I think it's the best book on heaven that's ever been written. It's by Randy Alcorn. It's an incredible book. And what he says is, he says, people say you can't know because 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, what no eye has seen, no heart can conceive. Okay, you can't know. But he goes, but keep reading. Amen. 1 Corinthians 2.10 says, now God has revealed these things to us by the Spirit, since the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. So, so there are things that we can't know, but the things that God has revealed, we should know. So, so I'm going to be honest. There's some stuff I'm going to tell you I don't know. But where God has revealed, we should pay attention to that. Similar thing happens at the beginning of the Bible back in Deuteronomy 29. The hidden things belong to the Lord our God. And if it was a period there, we go, hey, these things belong to God. We can't know. But it isn't a period. It's a comma. But the revealed things belong to us and our children forever so that we may follow all the words of this law. So what I want to do in this series is help us to be humble about what we don't know and be honest about what we do know. And if we do know it, begin to go, hey, how do we live now in light of it? So I just want to give you just a little preview. This is a short list of the questions that we can answer when it comes to what happens after we die. We can know what we will do in heaven. And let me just give you a heads up. It's not singing along with Jake for a thousand years, <laughs> even though we love singing with Jake. Who will we know? We will know people that we knew here. How will we exist? We'll dive into that next week. What will be rewarded in heaven? And where will we be? Some of us, we think we're just going to be floating in the clouds. Friends, you're wrong. And so the answers to these questions are important because how what I believe about life after we die, it shapes how I live today. So, so we get started with this series. There's some things I want you to do this week in addition to pondering these things. And the first one is this. I want you to identify your posture towards life after death. I told you that for a long time mine was I was scared of it. There were other seasons where I avoided it. And so I want you to think about these questions. Like how much peace do you have about death? Do you have peace that if tomorrow was your day, you'd be okay? Or, or do you feel anxiety about death? Are you excited about life after death or are you not excited? Do you have confusion about what it's going to be like or do you have clarity? I, I want you just to be honest with yourself and go, hey, what is this bringing up in me and where am I with this? That's important because sometimes in this series, I might say things you don't like I might push you in ways that you get uncomfortable, and it might be me. I mean, I might say something wrong. It happens every day. But you might react against me in a message because of what's in you. Amen. So sometimes when you get mad at a pastor, it's not the pastor, it's you. Sometimes it's me. I'm human. I can be a jerk sometimes. I fail. But I'd encourage you to reflect on yourself and the condition your heart is in and your posture is. Then number two, I want you to discuss what worldliness looks like in your community of friends. What does worldliness look like? Now, I know worldliness is not a word we often use. But here's the thing I've discovered. We are very good at judging other groups for the worldliness that is not present in our group. If, if you've ever said, you know, these kids on TikTok and the things they're posting, so worldly. Or man, these things that people watch or they do. Often what happens is one group will judge another group for their worldliness that's very visible. And these are the common things. Sexual, sexuality, sexual immorality, drunkenness, language, dress. Those are very visible. All the while, in that community that's doing the judging, is other things that are more invisible, like pride, arrogance, gossip, greed, superiority. 
You can't see those as easily as somebody who's cursing like a sailor and stumbling down the road. But both of them are sins, right? So I want you to discuss in your community of friends, what does worldliness look like? Because if that's the greatest danger, we ought to be aware of what it looks like. And we ought to look in the mirror as much as we do out the window. And pull the speck out of our eye, the log out of our eye before we go to the speck in somebody else's. And then number three, I want you to start creating a list of what you want to learn in this series. What are the things that you'd like to explore? What are the answers to the questions you'd like to find? What are the things you'd like to walk away with knowing? And if you already have a question you'd like us to answer, here's what I want you to do. I want you to send us that question. You can email it to us, contact at prescottcornerstone.com. Our team is going to collate that list. If you send it to me, I'm just going to forward it to them. So just send it to them. And then we will get to those in future messages in this series. Or on our final week, the whole message is going to be your questions. So it either can be a long sermon or a short sermon. It's up to you. Either a good sermon or a bad sermon. It's up to you. Now, what I'm going to do next, I never do. I never give you guys spoilers. I never tell you what's coming, but I'm going to do that in this series. Next Sunday, we're going to expose the biggest myths we believe about life after death. Because a bunch of you have inherited beliefs about life after death that are actually myths. And we're going to bust those. I'm not going to bring in, you know, goggles and make things explode in here because that would get us kicked out. That's what we'll do. The 21st, what about heaven? The 28th, what about hell? The 5th, what will we do in eternity? The 12th, how do we connect life today to life in eternity? And then the 19th, Q&A. That's what's coming. So if you know somebody that you think needs to hear some of this stuff, this gives you a heads up of when to invite them. If the room is full for hell week, I'm going to blame you and not me. <laughs> but I'd encourage you to pray for this. Like, we're wading into some stuff that's not easy. It's heavy to talk about these things. Because these aren't just hypotheticals, they're real. Everybody's going to die. Everybody will spend eternity somewhere. And how we live now is connected to what we believe about then. And so my hope is that over these next seven weeks, God's going to do something really special in our midst, and I'm excited to be on the journey with you. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for what you've done for us. And I pray that, that if we've lost a sense of what we had really clearly seven days ago, that the tomb is empty, that you're powerful and victorious, I pray that you would help us this morning to reach back and grab that clarity once again. Because you're just as resurrected on April 7th as you were on March 31st. The tomb is just as empty today as it was 2,000 years ago. Your power to defeat sin and death and the grave is just as real right now as it was then. And so I pray that, that we would have a sense and appreciation a trust in that that impacts how we live. Jesus, I pray that we would neither be too heavenly minded that we're of no earthly good, but also not so worldly minded that we never think about heaven and we're not on a mission. And I pray that you'd help us to understand and appreciate what has sustained your followers for 2,000 years a belief that you are in the process of making all things new. You are making all things right. That you are, you are moving towards an agenda and a purpose that, that we truly can't comprehend. But I pray that you'd help us to live the life we do have with hope. Because we know who is in charge and we know who is in control and we have glimpses of what's to come. We thank you, Jesus, for your love and your care for us. In your name we pray, amen.